today we're going to wrap up a series that we started last week, a little two-week mini-series on the life of Jonah. So let's pray together and we'll jump into the message this morning. Lord, I know that there are people in this room from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds and perspectives. Some of us grew up in church. Some of us are brand new to church. We're all at different places, but would you help us this morning? Would you just meet us right where we are and let us take a step with you? Let us grow a little bit closer to you. Let us hear your voice this morning. So if you're open to hearing from God, I just invite you to pray this very simple prayer. We pray every week together as a church. If you're new, just a simple, quiet prayer between you and God, something like this. Jesus, would you please speak to me today? Because I am listening. And then would you pray for somebody else? Maybe somebody you're seated beside, you came to church with today. Simple prayer for them, something like this. God, please talk to this person today. And give them the faith and the courage to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So glad you're here today with us walking through this teaching in the life of Jonah. If you weren't here last week, we jumped into the book of Jonah. And if you're looking for it in the Bible, you can go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn open with me. If you go to Matthew and kind of hang a left, a couple of books, you're going to run into Jonah. Uh, or you can look it up on your Bible app. Also, when you came in today, uh, in the side the worship guide is a little, a little outline you can take some notes on. I always think uh, if you take notes, you lean in, you kind of have the posture of a learner. It's a lot easier to get into heaven if you have notes that you've taken. So lean in, take a few notes. I think you get more out of it today. There'll be some verses on there, some things you could write down and remember and take home with you. Uh, I know people in our church who have collected those over the years, and it kind of becomes a spiritual journal for them, things they go back and remember on certain subjects. But last week, we started talking about the book of Jonah. And almost every person here in the room, whether even you're a church person or not, you know a little bit about the story of Jonah. And normally, when we say Jonah, the very first thing that comes to your mind is what? A whale, like a big fish. But this story is so much more than a guy getting swallowed by a big fish. It's so much more than a children's Bible story. Uh, it's, it really is about how we hear from God, how he encourages us, how he urges us to do things, and then we run from God often. And that's what we spent our time talking about last week when the word of the Lord came to Jonah and he said, I want you to go to Nineveh, which was a city that was a, involved in the Assyrian Empire. He said, I want you to go to them and I want you to preach a message of repentance. Jonah said, no, thank you. And he ran in the exact opposite direction. In fact, as far away from what God had called him to do as possible. He gets onto a boat. There's a giant storm. They realize it's his fault. They throw him overboard. He's swallowed by this fish. And we, we talked about last week how we run from God and how we can return, the reasons why we do. But then we'll, we pick it up in chapter 2 where he starts to pray. It says he's swallowed by this big fish and he says, oh God, which we all all would, right? And somehow, some way, miraculously, God allows Jonah to survive. And he goes through in chapter 2 this prayer of repentance. God, if you will rescue me, I will listen. If you'll give me another chance, I'll respond to you. And we end chapter 2 with this whale vomiting him up onto the beach. And in fact, it doesn't even say a whale. It just says a giant fish vomits him up onto the beach. And that's where we pick it up. In Jonah chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse number 1. We're going to read, actually, the last two chapters together of Jonah. It's only 11 verses, uh, but there's so much here to say to us together as the people of God, learning to listen to the voice of God and respond to it. So if you have a Bible, you want to turn there, you can. Or you can also look on the big, giant, electronic Bible screen to my right and left. Beginning in verse number one of chapter three in Jonah, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it a message I will give you. Don't you just love that verse? I mean, maybe my favorite verse in this whole story. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. 
He responds to him. He sees his repentance. He sees that he's, he's changed his course, and God gives him another chance. Aren't you grateful for second, third, 50th chances today and it says hey I want you to go he comes back to him he says I want you to go to Nineveh because often your point of departure is your point of return God doesn't change his mind God doesn't give him another alternative he says hey let's go back to what we talked about I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to proclaim a message that I will give you now isn't that comforting I don't even know what I'm going to have to say when I get there I'm just supposed to obey and go And so the next verse says, Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming this message. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. So Jonah goes into the city. We find out a little bit later that it's a large city and there's 120,000 people living in the city, which is a very large city for an ancient culture. I read in the paper this week. I don't read papers, but I read the front page of the paper that gets dropped off at my house before I threw it in the garbage can. But I read the Castle Rock News that 64,000 plus people now live in Castle Rock. It's the largest city in Douglas County. And uh, but so a city that's twice the size of Castle Rock, which I live there, it seems pretty crowded. There's a lot of traffic. There's a lot of people there. And he goes in and he starts to proclaim this eight word message. It's actually five words in Hebrew. A uh, very, very short message. Now, I, I'm a communicator. I speak a lot. I teach a lot. This is a very short, it's like five-second message, which some of you are like, that would be a great sermon. I would love that. <laughs> if, you, if we could work on that, I bet our church would grow even more. And, oh, we got it. Five seconds, we're out. But it's kind of offensive too, right? Hey, Nineveh, 40 days. That's what you got, 40 days. And then God's judgment. 40 days and the city will be overthrown. 40 is always a time of testing in the Bible. If you're new to the Bible and studying, like Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness, 40 years of wandering with the people in the wilderness, the people of Israel who were going to the promised land. It's always a time of testing. He's saying, you've got 40 days. There's a time limit. The clock is ticking. And this word overthrown, I thought was very interesting. It could be two meanings. It could be either there's destruction or it will be overturned and there'll be a new future for you, which I think is so many times God's message to us. There's destruction waiting if we keep going down this path, but there's also an opportunity to be overturned and to go in a new direction. So he gives this message. And in verse number five, it says, and the Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. So here's this group of people, and if you, if you don't remember from last week, this is a group of people who uh, are antagonistic toward the God of Israel. They are the enemies of the people of Israel. God uh, was, had judged them many times, but they were a group of people who, they were very violent They were sweeping through the area, destroying all kinds of nations. They were the enemy of Jonah. Jonah might even have known people who had been killed by the people in the city of Nineveh because they were always warring against the people of Israel. And so it says that he goes to them, he proclaims this eight-word message, and then there's repentance. And it says, and they believed not Jonah, but they believed God. You see, he was just the messenger. He just brought that word. And so often we think as we bring the message of God to other people that we have to say it in just the perfect way and have to be eloquent and have to know exactly the right words to put in order so that those person will respond. But here's what's happening is that God is already at work in those people. And he's already using his power. He just needed a faithful messenger to bring his words to them. They respond to them. I was with a, a guy one time, his name is Alex, and he, uh, he was one of the most faithful people to witness or to share a message about Jesus to, to anybody. He just had that gift of evangelism and could say just about anything. We, we were in a hot tub. Now, not just the two of us. That would be weird. Okay, our wives were there too. We were in Dallas. 
uh, at a hotel at a staff retreat. We're sitting in there, maybe two or three couples, and these teenage boys had jumped the fence to get into the hot tub at the hotel. They get into the thing. He strikes up a conversation with them, starts talking to them, and I thought, this is so awkward. This is so awkward. And he just starts talking to them about Jesus, leads them to faith in Jesus, and baptizes them in the hot tub. (laughs) Can you believe? I mean, we were right there. Amy and I were like, if I had said that, it would have sounded so stupid. I mean, he was. The, have you ever met like a person who, who, they're just so contagious when they talk about their faith? We were in Subway, same guy. We're in Subway one time going through. She's making the thing. He said something like, you know, Jesus is the bread of life. And I'm like, God, that is so corny. <laughs> that girl started coming to church, became a Christian, like, so anyway, I just kind of picture this moment where Jonah comes in. He's reluctant. He doesn't want to do that. He starts preaching this message. Eight-word message is kind of offensive, but God was at work. It wasn't really about the words that were said. Those teenage boys, honestly, they were meant to be there that night, and he shared what they needed to hear, and it, it was powerful and amazing. It goes on to say, When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, sat down in the dust. So the king, the one who's in power there, he, he comes up off of his throne, which, again, is the first step to repentance, like realizing I'm not in control. And he comes up off his throne, takes off his royal robes, and he too puts on sackcloth. If you're new, sackcloth, if you're new to the Bible, sackcloth was something that they would put on. It was made of goat hair, think like burlap. And it, it was what you wore when you were mourning. Uh, there's probably not a section at Target with like sackcloth that you can get anymore. Maybe an aisle at TJ Maxx, but they put it on and because you can find just about anything at TJ Maxx. And, uh, but they, they put it on as a sign of repentance. They put it on as a sign to say we're, we're open to hearing from God. And he, he goes on to say, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink. Don't let people and animals be covered, or excuse me, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God and let them give up their evil ways and their violence. That, that, that is the formula of repentance. That, and the word repentance just means to turn around, to go in a new direction. It's not a big, scary Bible word. It just means I, I'm going the wrong way. I need to go this way. And he says, in order to do that, we call urgently on God and we give up the path that we're currently on. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw that they did this, he turned, they had turned from their evil ways. He relented. It did not bring on them destruction that he had threatened. And you would think at this moment in the book of Jonah, you're like, yes, this is the climax. This is it. This is amazing. This amazing city, uh, 120,000 pagans, people who were against the God of Israel, are now repenting and turning to God. You would think there would be cause for great joy and celebration in the life of Jonah. But verse number one of chapter four says, but But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Now, why is that? Because he hated these people. They were his enemies. He judged them. He thought he was worthy of the grace of God, but they were not. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. I mean, the irony of this, right? a, A chapter before, he's in the belly of the fish because he had been running from God. And God had given him another chance, and now he did not want to give this group of 120,000 people the same opportunity. He was so blinded by his own pride and religiosity, by his own anger and judgment toward these people, that he could not even enjoy the fact that God was at work among these people. And he just, he's so, mm, so glad I'm not like that. 
so glad Christians have moved on from that now. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Then I just, I love this scene. Jonah had gone out and sat down, like pouting, outside the city. It says there he made himself a little shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen. Then the Lord, this is amazing, God's about to teach him something. The Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade over his head to ease his discomfort because it's hot or in the desert. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. You see where this is going? I'm old, man. Sore. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint and he wanted to die and said, it's better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is. I'm so angry. I wish I was dead. (laughs) You love all the perfect people in the Bible. But the Lord said, you have been so concerned about this plant, though you didn't tend it, make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died up and died overnight. And should not I have great concern, have concern over the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people. See that difference? Plants and people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. 11, about 21 verses here in Jonah. But this last scene, he should be so ecstatic. He should be so excited that God used him powerfully to help these people come to know him. But he sits down and he pouts and this plant grows up over him and provides shade. And then it dies the next day. And he says, there's a bunch of people here you should be concerned. And you're way more concerned about a plant. So what what does this have to say to us? So For the remainder of our time here, just for a few minutes, I want you to grab your outline, and I want to give you like four big thoughts today out of these couple of chapters here in Jonah that I think apply to us and to our lives. The first one that we need to understand is that God uses broken messengers to reach broken people. Despite Jonah's insolence, despite him running, despite his obstinance toward these people, God still uses him. God uses broken people, broken messengers, to reach broken people. And sometimes, I just want to be really honest with you, like we live in a community uh, where when we look at the people on the outside, it looks like we have it all together. If you peer into the window, we are a pretty people. We're, a lot of you are really good looking. I'm looking out at you right now. You're all really, you've all lost weight. Um, <laughs> It seems like we, we, we have it all together, or we're really good at pretending that we have it all together. But I just want to remind you, I just keep coming back almost week after week, just reminding our church that we are full of messy and broken people. God, listen, God uses broken people because there are no other kind. None of us has it together. We're just all a little bit better at pretending. But when you peel back the curtain, when you tear off the package a little bit, we're all struggling. And God takes whatever mess we have and says, I can employ that in the service of other people. Just last week, I just want to remind you, just just last week we talked about running from God. I'm standing in the atrium. Two, three, four people find me afterwards and say, I've been running from God for a long time. I'm dealing with alcoholism. I've never talked to anybody about my my sexual abuse in the past. Uh, My marriage is falling apart. My relationship with my kid is disintegrating, and I don't know how to help them. Every person you lock eyes with, they're all fighting a battle. They're all broken. They're all messy. And that does not disqualify you from God using you. I love that verse in the very first verse of chapter 3. And the, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah, what? A second time. It's amazing. We serve the God of second chances. And some of you came in here this morning with the belief that you have reached the end of God's rope. 
like you're done. It's over for you. And I just came to proclaim, if it's only one of you this morning, God isn't finished with you yet. You have not reached the end of his grace. As long as you have breath in your lungs, God is making available his grace. Doesn't mean there's not consequences. Doesn't mean we can hop in the DeLorean and go back in time and change everything. But it does mean that this moment right now, God receives us and gives us. He, we serve the God of the second chance. Here's another big idea for us this morning. We have to stop making comfort our greatest concern. I mean, that's part of why Jonah didn't go, right? He just didn't want to leave the area of comfort for himself. And we, again, live in a community that is very comfortable, And many times that's one of our highest priorities is how do I feel about this? Does this inconvenience me in any way? But listen, if we are going to be followers of Jesus, which is what most of you here in this room want to be, we have to understand that comfort cannot be our highest concern. That when we... When we follow Jesus, he will take us into the uncomfortable places. He will take us into the places that are challenging. He will take us into the places that feel difficult for us. But as we follow him into that, that's when we grow. That's when other people are impacted by us. It's stepping out of those comfort places. Listen, obedience, when you don't feel like it, is still obedience. It's a big spiritual principle that we have to understand. If we're waiting to feel like following Jesus and obeying him in a certain area, we're going to be waiting for a long time because he always urges us out into the difficult places. Uh, I remember like, very vividly my, my wife decided that she wanted to do triathlons, probably because she'd been tempted by the devil and I wasn't praying for her <laughs> enough. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but she said, I'm going to do this. And so her and her little friend, Jenny, signed up for a short distance triathlon. And it was like an Olympic distance, I think. Is that right? And so I remember vividly the day that she came home and her and her girlfriend, Jenny, had calculated at the rec center how many laps they would have to swim for the distance of the triathlon. And she came home in tears and she said, there is no way we can do this. There is no, I cannot, we can't do this. But if, you, if anybody knows my wife, she is an ultra committed and competitive person. And once she commits to do something, she is going to do it. So they just got in the pool and it was uncomfortable and it was challenging and they didn't feel like doing it, but they just kept swimming. She had to teach herself how to do that. I mean, she knew how to swim, but she didn't know how to swim for distance. And she did. And they had a great time and they finished the race. And less than a year later, I believe, she did a half Ironman and swam about 10 times that in the thing. But she just started. Sometimes God is leading us out of a place that it, at this moment will be uncomfortable. But years from now, your faith will be built in such a way that you'll think, I don't even know why I thought that was uncomfortable. And then guess what? God will lead you to an even more uncomfortable place because he's growing you and he's using you. Now, again, if you're a guest with us, this isn't for you. But if you're part of the family of Journey, we remind ourselves of this all the time. We are not a collection of consumers. We are Christians who are contributors, so we think about things that really matter, and, and our highest priority is the people who are part of the family of journey is not our comfort. It's what is important to God. And so as our church grows, our leadership team, we're thinking all the time about how do we make room for more? How do we, how do we make a place for more people? And so we are adding more parking, and we are adding another service. But the people who call this place home, this is your house, we're always thinking about how do we say to other people, no, you go first. We're always thinking, I'm going to give my seat up. I'm going to be a little bit inconvenient. I might ride the shuttle. Oh, my goodness, I'd have to get here at least seven minutes early to do that. And I'm normally 17 minutes late, so I guess that's... I'm, it's too early for math. But you know what I mean. It's, 
So we, we're thinking about that, like as a church, all during the week. The, because, listen, listen, this is so important, is that if the person we say that we follow is Jesus, and Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, then we want a watching world to look at our church and say, there's messy people in there, and they're always thinking about other people like the person they say they follow. I don't know if I believe everything they believe, but they believe it. They're follow- if the way that we believe we get to God is through a cross, then the people who call this place home could give up a seat or move to a different service or say, you know what, I had to wait a little bit on the shuttle. It wasn't a big deal. You know, that's what the kind of people we want to be as a church. I love this, Jonah 3.3. 3. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went. He took action. Big three idea, number three is let go of your judgment. Jonah could not experience the joy of God doing something among these people because his judgment was in the way. We're going to talk about a lot, a lot of these ideas in the next couple of weeks when we do this series on asking for a friend. But this is so incredibly important for us as the people of Jesus. So many times we live in a culture that is more us versus them than any time I can remember. Especially, I mean, social media just accentuates this. Like, you're over here, I'm over here. Here's the line. It doesn't matter what political persuasion or religious persuasion or social persuasion. We're always categorizing people and putting them into this bubble, into this circle. They're like this. But I have found that my disdain for people is directly related to my distance from them. Because the closer I get to people, the more I realize, oh, these are creations of God. These are people just like me. The very people that I put into a category and say I'm so vehemently against are loved dearly by God. We want to be a group of people, a church, a family, that whoever walks in the door, you are welcome into the house of God. You are welcome here among us no matter what you're struggling with. We want to drop our judgment. Listen, uh, maybe number four is this, is to be concerned about the things that God is concerned about, namely people. Just to continue that thought of not letting judgment get in the way of our joy, let's be concerned about the things that God is concerned about and what he is concerned about is people. Um, Here, Jonah gets robbed of this amazing opportunity because he's more worried about the plant than the people. He's more worried about his comfort and convenience and his ease rather than what God is doing among the people. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do, just in a really practical way. If you call this place home, this is where you go to church, is here's what I'm going to ask you to do. During the month of September, I want you to think about inviting one person in your circle of influence to church with you. One person. Not the whole community. I don't want anybody walking up and down your street with big signs saying, repent, the end is near. None of that. I want you to invite one person. One person with you to church, a family member, a friend, a coworker, a person you coach soccer with, a guy you work out with, one, one person that is in your circle, I want you to invite them to church. And I want you to think about three things, okay? Write these down. That you should take personal responsibility. The person that you live beside, that you work beside, that you work out with, that, you, that you're in a golf foursome with, You're not connected to that person for no reason. Like God knew before the foundation of the world that you that you would be connected to them. And He has placed you, just like He did Jonah, into their life. He's connected you relationally in this grid with them. And then here's what I want you to do: I want you to build a personal relationship with them. You might already have a really personal relationship with them. But the most important step along the way in sharing something that's really important is to have a relationship with someone. I mean, they're not a notch on the belt. They're not somebody you're trying to proselytize. They're not a number. This is a person that God loves and cares about deeply. So I build a relationship with them that could bear the weight of a heavy conversation about something like following Jesus or coming to church with you. Uh, And I can prove it to you. Every so often, someone will knock on your door in your neighborhood And typically they're wearing a white shirt and a tie and they want to talk about deep religious matters. And what do we all do? We turn the lights off and pretend like we're not home. Because we don't want to talk about something that important with a stranger. Just yell at your kids, shut up! 
There's somebody ringing the doorbell. Get down. Unless they have cookies. Then we all run to the door to get the cookies. So anyway, build a personal relationship. And the last thing is just give an invitation. Actually say out loud, hey, I'd love for you to come to church with me this Sunday. And you think, man, I just don't, I don't know how that's going to work. It's a little bit awkward. What will happen? Well, let's just trust that what will happen happened with Jonah, with these people. That, that God is already at work in that person's life. You're praying for them. You're thinking about them. You want to help them take their steps to find their way home. And, and you just invite them. Just say, hey, I'd love for you to come. This Last week, Corey and I, our small groups pastor, were working out at our gym, and there's a guy that I've been working out with for a long time, and we're just having a conversation, and, and I say to him, uh, hey, man, uh, I don't know if you and your family go to church anywhere, but we would love for you guys to come with us sometimes. And he goes, oh, you and Corey, you go, I knew Corey worked at that church, and, you know, and where do you, yeah, we go to the same church. We actually work together, and I told him where it was, and he's like, yeah, sure, I think we'll come. So we'd love to have you. You can come be our guest. Now, that was just a very natural, normal conversation, and you might say, well, of course you would do that. Like, you're the preacher guy. Like, you, of course you would do that, and you know how to say those things. But honestly, I work out with the same group of people almost every day. I don't want to be the religious nut job. Like I, you, just like you, I, I don't want to be that guy who's like, well, every time I strike up a conversation with him, he's like, turns it to religion, and it's all weird. I don't want to be that. So there's always this moment of trepidation. But I thought, I've been working out with this guy forever, and he's so nice, and I hope he comes sometime. And I just threw it out there like a grenade. <laughs> How's this going to go when it goes off? Uh, and it went great. So last thing I'll just ask you is, uh, am I more like Jesus or, or Jonah? I mean, I know that's a simple thought, but you know, Jonah goes down to Joppa and then he goes down into the ship and down into the sea to get away from God's call. But Jesus comes down to fulfill God's call. Jonah has disdain for the people he's trying to reach. He has judgment for them. Jesus has love and says, I didn't come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Jesus goes to the cross to stand in our place for our sin and bring us to him. But maybe before the band comes, let me ask you this question. Maybe what you needed to hear today was, was not that you, you might be experiencing some of the stuff of Jonah, but that you, listen, you, you may be a Ninevite. And God's message to you today, you just wound up at Journey or been coming for a while. God's message to you today is you need to turn away from what you've been doing. You, you need to return to me. You, you need to repent. And you need to come home. Maybe that's what God is calling you to today. And just like the people of Nineveh, you would respond like them, you would say, you're right. I've been going in the wrong direction. I, I need to return to God. I need to start following Jesus. So if that's you today, I want to give you an opportunity to take, to take that step. Because that's really, really huge and important. It's a turning point in your life. So why don't we all bow our heads and close our eyes. So right there where you are today, if, if that's you... If you say, you know what, I, I don't know if I'm so much Jonah, I've never really heard a word from the Lord, but today I realize I, I've listened to a message and I, I need to repent. I need to turn to God. I need to start following Jesus. If that's you today, I want to invite you to do just that. As simple as saying a prayer, calling on God and saying something like this, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you lived for me, you died on the cross for my sin, that you rose from the grave. I, I believe that. And I want to turn away from the things I've, I've been doing and the life I've been chasing, and I want to turn to you. Forgive me of all the things I've done wrong. Come into my life. Save me. Now listen, without anybody looking around, I promise I would never call on you, embarrass you in any way. But I would like to pray for you today. I would like to know that you took that step. If you just said, today, I'm turning. Today, I'm coming to Jesus. I just prayed that prayer with you, Scotty. Would you just rift your hand up real high so I could pray for you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. All over the room. Yes. 
Yes. Lord, thank you for the maybe dozen or so people who say, yes, I, I want to follow Jesus. We're so grateful for that today. Maybe you're here in the room and honestly, you're like Jonah and you've been pursuing comfort. You've let judgment get in the way. You've let this lie that you're broken and don't have it all together. So how could God use you stand in the way? But would you maybe right now in this moment say a simple prayer, God, would you please use me to help somebody else find their way back to you? Show me who I'm supposed to invite. Thank you.